Greetings, my friends, and happy day to you. My name is Joe Savino. I'm the pastor at the uh, Wenatchee Seventh-day Adventist Church in Wenatchee, Washington. I'm glad that you joined me. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this weekend, we're celebrating mothers, and, uh, and so I thought it would be appropriate to have a message about God's gift to us through our mothers. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Lord in heaven, thank you so much for uh, this time that we can share together today. And I pray that you will inspire us and encourage us as we uh, salute uh, the mothers that each one of us has, has been given. And uh, we just look forward to this time and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So my uh, sermon title today is Mothers, We Salute You. And I'm going to begin with uh, an, an unlikely uh, sermon passage uh, from Romans 16, verses 1 through 16. If you'll bear with me, I chose to read it in the uh, New Living Translation. I think it reads a little more easily. And we're going to see a list of people that the Apostle Paul is sending greetings to. All right, so let's just start with that. Romans 16, I commend to you our sister Phoebe who is a deacon in the church in Centria. Welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor among God's people. Help her in whatever way she needs, for she has been helpful to many, and especially to me. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. In fact, they once risked their lives for me. I'm thankful to them, and so are all the Gentile churches. Also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. Greet my dear friend Apinitus. He was the first person from the province of Asia to become a follower of Christ. Give my greetings to Mary, who has worked so hard for your benefit. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, who were in prison with me. They are highly respected among the apostles and became followers of Christ before I did. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachys. Greet Apelles, a good man whom Christ approves, and give my greetings to the believers from the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet the Lord's people from the household of Narcissus. Give my greetings to Tryphena and Tryphosa, the Lord's workers, and to dear Persis, who has worked so hard for the Lord. Greet Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, and also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. Give my greetings to Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who meet with them. Give my greetings to Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and to Olympus and all the believers who meet with them. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. All the churches of Christ send you their greetings. Why in the world did we look at this list? Well, I chose this list for a couple of reasons. First of all, of the 26 people who Paul singles out among all the other believers, he singles out 26 people. Of those 26 who he singles out for his personal greeting, six of them were women. Now remember, this was a male-dominated society. They did not refer to women as much as uh, they did men. We just know that about uh, the Bible days. That's how their culture was. But Paul goes ahead and, and includes six women uh, affectionately in uh, his greetings. Now, that's interesting since Paul has frequently gotten a bum rap for, you know, being a male chauvinist. And I think it also shows a tremendous, the, the tremendous influence that women had in the early church. I really do. Paul could not describe the church in Rome without mentioning the significant role of women. Now, the other reason I wanted to share this verse was verse 13. If you look at that, it's one that Bible scholars have struggled with a little bit. In some versions, Paul's words say, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, 
and his mother and mine. And written like that, it, it could be taken two ways. It could mean that Paul had two women in mind, the mother of Rufus and his own personal mother. Or he could be saying, greet Rufus and also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. I believe that's what he meant. In fact, the New Living Translation and other translations, uh, more recent translations, uh, they, they word it that way. But that raises some interesting questions about his relationship with, with uh, her. When and where did uh, Paul meet Rufus' mother? And uh, did she, she nurse him through some you know, serious illness that he had? Might he have stayed at her house uh, during one of his missionary journeys? Uh, did, did, how, did, how did this woman and Paul form such a close bond? Why does he refer to her fondly uh, as being like his mother. The Gospel of Mark tells us that Simon of Cyrene, you remember him, the man who carried Jesus' cross? That man, Simon of Cyrene, had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. Was this the same Rufus Paul mentions here? If he is, his mother would be the wife of Simon of Cyrene. I mean, you know, th this man's mother would be the wife of Simon of Cyrene, the man who carried Jesus' cross. So now you've got a, a connection, right? No one knows for sure who this remarkable woman uh, was who served as a mother figure for Paul, but it could have been the wife of Simon of Cyrene who carried Jesus' cross. But you know what? It's okay if we don't have that figured out. It really doesn't matter. What Paul writes makes an excellent Mother's Day sermon, <laughs> doesn't it? Because she was a mother to him. Some people think that um, Mother's Day is just sentimental foolishness, you know. we we got to admit that there is sentiment to Mother's Day. But what's wrong with that? A little bit of uh, sentiment is healthy. Of course, there are some women in the Bible who were poor examples of, of motherhood, you know, and, and yes, there are women even today who abandon or abuse or even corrupt their children, their own children, and who create a, a, a poor role model for them. But they are by far the exception. I think most mothers do the right things and deserve recognition. So, this morning, I'd like to join Paul and salute all mothers, all the mothers who are represented out there in TV land, <laughs> who are viewing today, and all the mothers who are represented. I, I just want to salute you today, and, and I think we should salute mothers for three reasons that I'm going to give you today. First of all, mothers should be saluted for their persistent love. Let me give you an example of that. I've noticed something when I've been in hospital waiting rooms. Uh, those, those rooms just wear out fathers a whole lot more quickly than they do mothers. It just has been my observation. Maybe it's been yours too. I mean, fathers become impatient, you know, and they're going in and out. They're pacing. They, they're trying to stay busy all the time. But mothers, they're just sitting there sticking it out. They stick it out. A mother's love simply cannot be denied, you know? We read in the Old Testament about a mother. Her name was Rizpah. Is that a familiar name for you? Rizpah was not a very nice woman. She had two illegitimate sons by, by King Saul. And uh, later, when David ascended to the throne following King Saul, he had these two sons killed. He had them executed, not just because they were King Saul's illegitimate sons, but because they had participated in a conspiracy. And, and that conspiracy resulted in the deaths of many people. It's an interesting story. And so David ordered that their bodies should be hung out on the public gallows as an example to, to other, you know, possible conspirators. So he made an example out of them, and there they hung in the public gallows. And that's when Rizpah comes back into the picture again. She goes to this execution site, and she begins a sad and lonely vigil beside the, the bodies of her two sons. 
that are up on the gallows. And we're told in this very hideous scene that she drove away the vultures by day and the jackals by night. She didn't want scavengers there, and you can figure out why. And when David heard what his mother did, he was moved. What this mother did, not his mother. <laughs> he was moved to compassion. And he, so he went to Gibeon. He had those bodies taken down and given a proper burial. Rizpah's vig vigil speaks to the persistent love of all mothers. Any mother would have done that. The poet Rud Rudyard Kipling wrote these words, If I were hanged on the highest hill, I know whose love would follow me still. Mother of mine, mother of mine. If I were drowned in the deepest sea, I know whose tears would come down to me. Mother of mine, mother of mine. If I were damned by body and soul, I know whose prayers would make me whole. Mother of mine, mother of mine. You know, long after some fathers have disowned their children, a mother would still be there. A mother's going to be by her children. There's a persistence there that we just must salute. Reason number two. Uh, mothers need to be saluted for the tremendous impact they've had on the lives of each and every one of us. I'm convinced that the person who influenced Jesus the most, second only, of course, to God the Father, was Mary, Jesus' mother. And that's not to de detract from, from Joseph's role, of course. Had he lived, uh, I think he would have stood right there on Calvary's hill, right next to Mary, of course. He was a great earthly father. But Mary's role in God's plan certainly clearly did not end when she gave birth to Jesus, did it? God used her to help mold the personality and the ministry of Jesus. Listen to how John be begins the second chapter of his gospel, John 2 verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Mary was always there. As often as she could be, she was around Jesus, and she was there for Jesus. Her love just sur seemed to surround him. She stayed close to him. And then Mark 3.32 says, And a multitude was sitting around him, speaking of Jesus, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Always wanted to be around him. And then, with the sin of the whole world on his shoulders as he hung on that cross, one of the last thoughts that Jesus had on the cross was for the welfare of his mother. John 19, 26 and 27, When Jesus, saw, therefore, saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Jesus asked John, this is who that story is about, we believe. He asked John to take care of his mom, you see. And the same type of influence can be seen in other people down through the years. And maybe you could uh, note some. I'll just note a couple of them. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he was so deeply influenced by his mother, Susanna Wesley. He and his brother Charles were very, very influenced by Susanna. Abraham Lincoln led uh, this nation, this great nation, through one of its greatest crises. But who made that president the man that he was? Lincoln said it was his mother. In many different ways, we've all been influenced greatly by our mothers, haven't we? And then the final reason that I want to share today that we should be saluting our mothers is because where they are is where home is. Isn't that true? Uh, a minister was visiting a family. Uh, he was pastoring in Memphis, and uh, he was visiting this new family to town. They had just moved there from Baltimore, Maryland. And the pastor asked the man if he was originally from Baltimore. And the man said these words to him. He said, no, my family moved around frequently. There's really no one place that uh, I can say was home. I suppose 
wherever mother was, that's where home was. Isn't that true? Julie and I love it up here in the Northwest. We've always loved it uh, here. So far, we're up to almost 15 years of our ministry that we've spent here in the Northwest. We love it, and we consider it paradise, but Southern California is home. We can't, we can't avoid that. We can't ignore that. Southern California is home because that's where our family is. Uh, may, you know, maybe a number of you can identify that way as well. A house is just a physical place. A home is where our loved ones are. And wherever mother is, that's home. Well, just in closing, let me just say that it is appropriate that we single out a day in the year to recognize mothers. But th there shouldn't be a day that goes by when we don't call our mothers blessed. Blessed, to use the King James Version. <laughs> and, and the very highest tribute that we can give to our mother, and this is just a challenge to each one of us, the highest tribute that we could give to our mother is not to praise her, not to give her a gift, not to pay her a visit, not even simply to go to church with her on her special big weekend. The greatest tribute that you and I can give to our mother is to be the kind of person that she always hoped that we'd be. Happy Mother's Day to you. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, you are so good to us. What a wonderful and loving Heavenly Father you are to each one of us. Thank you, Father, for giving us our mothers, godly mothers, are such a blessing to each one of us, have been, have helped to shape us, to shape our personality, to shape our character, to lead us in the ways that we should go, and to lead us to the foot of the cross. So today we thank you for our mothers, and we are grateful for the work that they do. We pray, Father, that we will indeed honor them by being all that they hoped we would be, and all that you hope we can be. So we thank you for this time that we've, we've shared with this special emphasis, and we pray these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. I hope you do have a blessed Mother's Day. God bless you. We'll see you again soon.